Good morning, everybody. We are going to uh, get started. Thank you very much for being here. We are just uh, uh, waiting for the minister from Colombia, but uh, judging from the queues that I saw at the gate, uh, it may take a couple more minutes. So in the meantime, we're going to start. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we are very uh, excited uh, to start the week after the SDGs were adopted with uh, basically working towards providing solutions for uh, one uh, or two or more uh, of the SDGs, depending on how you look at it. So this session is precisely about how we can, working together, governments, uh, private sector, and international organizations, together with civil society, implement solutions that will address the goals that were adopted last week. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in terms of goals, it would be uh, SDG number two, which talks about ending hunger, uh, achieving food security, improving nutrition, and promoting sustainable agriculture. But frankly, a lot of what we will be doing also has to do with SDG 12, which is about uh, sustainable production and consumption patterns. So today is about providing solutions to make sure we end extreme poverty by 2030. I'm very happy uh, to uh, be with you today uh, together with uh, our colleagues from the UN Global Compact and I want to uh, give a warm welcome to Lisa Kingo, the new head of the UN Global Compact, uh, who is a vital partner in this effort of providing solutions uh, in the area of uh, food security, farming, agriculture, uh, also very happy to do this uh, with uh, women in Parliament. At the end of the day, we know very well that it's the legislator that matters uh, to change uh, laws, regulations on the ground that are going to be uh, helping us uh, provide solutions. Uh, and there, um, it's uh, Linda Lanzilotta, Vice President uh, from the Senate of the Republic of Italy. Welcome. Uh, we will uh, hear and see in a minute uh, Tatiana Orozco, Minister for Social Prosperity, Government of Colombia, a country that uh, is uh, extremely, for whom agriculture, food security is extremely important, but also a country that is going, is embarking into a peace process, a big uh, part of which will be reintegrating uh, many displaced uh, including many displaced farmers into society. So we will hear from her and her uh, perspective on how to um, make uh, good of this SDG2. And then I'm extremely uh, pleased to have with us uh, Kanayo Guanze, is the president of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, is the uh, person in this room uh, that knows about uh, farmers and farming, uh, is uh, an authority on that. Uh, we only talk about this, but uh, you know it because uh, your organization does it and does it extremely well. Um, so, this, in this session, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to look at how governments are getting ready to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, how international organizations can support uh, in implementing in governments, uh, implementing those goals. We are going to look at the uh, perspectives from the private sector, how the private sector in its different manifestations, the big, the medium, the small, uh, those that set uh, standards in agriculture or agrofood, those who certify uh, for those standards, those who audit those standards, uh, can uh, contribute to the sustainable agricultural practices. We are going to look at how to leverage technology technology, 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 to provide solutions uh, to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and I'm particularly happy to have GS1 uh, together with us uh, today. Uh, and uh, finally, we are going to zoom in uh, a number of uh, agricultural sectors, starting with coffee, and zooming in a particular region, ASEAN, one that, uh, for whom agriculture, again, is of particular importance to reaching those goals. So with, without further ado, I'm going to uh, give uh, the floor to Lise Kingo. Uh, Lise will uh, uh, have to leave us uh, in a short while, but I thought it's important that uh, we hear from her. Uh, again, this being 
a true partnership we are trying to, uh, the sense of true partnership we are trying to send you uh, with putting together this event. So, Lisa, the floor is yours. Arantxa, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for being here this morning. Um, and particular to speak about the importance of the SDT2. I believe there's no more exciting time to be working with companies large and small around the world to make business a force for good. The last couple of days here at the UN, I think has been a historic event that many of us will remember in many years to come. Um, and it's very inspiring also to work with the ITC and so many others that share a, commit, a, a commitment to drive action on key societal issues. I have to say, I think the partnership idea is taking off more and more, and it's so important at this moment where we have the new SDGs. But the private sector action will be key to the success of the global goals, and particular, particularly the SDG 2. We hope that the food and agriculture business principles can be a source of direction and inspiration for companies of all sizes, advancing the positive impact of business in this space and enabling more principle-based partnerships. The FAB principles are intended to provide a common foundation for all companies regardless of size, crop or location. We need more companies to collaborate with the UN, with governments, with civil society and others to help deliver global food security solutions and align their operations to help meet the targets outlined in SDG 2. All the SDGs put people at the center of development and hopefully will, will spur inclusive business efforts, which will be so important to bringing many more small farmers into the value chain. It is time that more companies drive innovation, strengthen supply chains, and build markets while empowering low-income populations. As the SDGs move from global goals to national priorities, there's great opportunity for our organizations to promote the importance of sustainable agriculture and inclusive business in local contexts. We at the Global Compact believe that our more than 85 local networks in all regions of the world can be hubs for SDG action and innovation for businesses of all sizes. I thank you all for coming today and wish you a successful meeting. The UN Global Compact look forward to strengthening our partnership with the ITC and all of you in these important years to come for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lise, and welcome to Tatiana Orozco. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to be the U.S. president when he arrives uh, in this house. He has president, so he made uh, Tatiana wait, but uh, luckily she is, uh, she is with us. Uh, Tatiana is the Minister for Social Prosperity in the Government of Colombia. Tatiana, before you arrive, I was mentioning that uh, agriculture, food security, SDG2, is extremely important for Colombia that we are very eager to hear what Colombia is doing to get ready to implement uh, the Sustainable Development Agenda, but there is also a dimension that is the dimension of the peace process that Colombia is embarked upon, in which a big part of the answer will be uh, bringing uh, previously displaced uh, farmers into uh, the mainstream. Uh, I can see that you're wearing the uh, 
the uh, fifth symbol uh, from President Santos. So without further ado, Tatiana, the floor is yours. Much um, and again, sorry, but as you mentioned, uh, President Obama was coming in, so we the people have to wait. Um, good morning to all. Please allow me to, to frame this dialogue in the current situation that Colombia um, is having nowadays and give you some information that will help you understand the depth of Colombia's commitment to the sustainable development goals and how seriously we are taking the blue numbers model. Uh, Colombia, just to frame a little bit, Colombia in terms of size, it's about twice the size of France and close to three times the size of Germany. We have 1,100 municipalities and in almost 600 of them we grow coffee. That's around 54% of our land. Coffee is grown in Colombia by close to 600,000 families. They're more estimated to 560,000 and the numbers have been growing over the last couple of years. And coffee has been a, the largest employment generator and contributor to the rural GDP. As you will know, we have faced a um, very complex civil conflict that has lasted for more than 50 years, and that is one of the main reasons that President Santos has embarked himself and the whole country in this peace process, because we believe that when we achieve um, the end of the, when we get to the end of the negotiations, we will be it, we will have some um, framework that will allow us to continue and to broaden the work that we have done in the rural areas of Colombia. Um, the conflict had, has not only cost Colombia thousands and thousands of lives, but it has also torn apart our social fabric in urban and rural areas, mostly in the countryside, including, of course, internally displaced people. But also it hasn't allowed us to... Um, develop the rural land in the best way possible. In the economic front, uh, this has cost us, some people estimate that when we, the conflict is over, we will grow from 1 to 2 percent more. Our GDP will be growing annually from 1 to 2 percent more, depending on the, on the studies that you look into. Um, and we have to catch up a lot on inter in terms of infrastructure, particularly in that rural areas and in many areas that are very fertile for agriculture. Because some of this infrastructure has been non-existent due to this particular conflict. However, the toughest days of violence in Colombia, we believe, are over. The fact that President Santos last week announced um, a big understanding of one particular point regarding justice um, makes us believe that the, the peace agreement will be signed and we have established a time frame of around six months for that to end. So that is very good news for Colombia, and we are very excited about that. Because as violence has diminished significantly in the last 15 years, we have been able to focus more on issues beyond our borders and in regaining Colombia's leadership role in all matters of interest to the international community. Social, economic, and environmental sustainability is at the forefront of our priorities, and we have, been, um, we have been working very hard with the SDGs. Also, global food safety is also a key concern of Colombia, and we see here a great opportunity to take a leadership role in this matter. And let me tell you that particularly in the, in the negotiation agreements with the uh, uh, FARC, we've, there is a whole chapter on food security. So that is also very interesting for us in the next couple of years. That is why I want to start by saying that Colombia is deeply committed to the sustainable development goals and to implement the blue numbers, and we are working in that direction. Our uh, national development plan has included some of the SDGs already, and the whole plan was worked around some of these SDGs. So Colombia is among a pilot group of countries that include, of course, the Netherlands, Denmark, Turkey, Malaysia, Vietnam, for the blue numbers. Um, at the same time, to date, uh, well over 40 large multinationals have publicly committed to improve their sourcing practices, including by using voluntary standards in their supplier relationships and to source significant agricultural raw material inputs sustainably in their coming years. All these countries are using the blue numbers to establish greater competitive advantage in the global marketplace 
for the various commodities they produce and handle. In Colombia, particularly, the community that is starting to implement this model is the coffee growers. Hence, the task is being addressed by the national government and the National Federation of Coffee Growers of Colombia, whom we have here the maximum representative of this institution here in the U.S., Mr. Juan Esteban Ordus, uh, who, and he will explain uh, the details in a few minutes. However, I do want to state two things. First, that no other country, we believe, um, or organization has advanced more in the implementation of the blue numbers than Colombia or the FNC. That's what we believe. I don't know. You can, you can talk me into changing my mind. Um, and that is very important because of the magnitude of the uptake of blue numbers by FNC, which is significantly larger than the other pilot countries. Uh, we believe there is an opportunity for demonstrating competitive advantage tied to the knowledge and understanding of each individual farmer, and it has been enhanced by this. This is not a claim that any other country will, make, will be able to make in the near future because it will take them, we believe, some time to ramp up to the tens of thousands of actors that FNC has already introduced to the system. And because we are part of the members of FCN, but FNC, I'm sorry, but we are not FNC. As a member of government, I would like to congratulate in, in this particular group the effort that the FNC has been made for this to be able to happen. No other rural organization in the world that I know of has the level of information and the capacity to implement actions on the ground as the FNC has. This model, which we support deeply, will allow us to continue establishing and maintain competitive advantage by leveraging on the values embodied in the SDGs. It links the prospects of the future we want directly to the measurable betterment of individual farmers and the communities and markets that they represent or work with. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And now I give the, the floor, if, you, if I may, to Mr. Orduz. He will explain the model that he has been implemented in Colombia. Thank you. So we're going to uh, um, uh, hear from uh, Juan Esteban Orduz in, uh, in a minute. Before we do that, I want to bring in the other perspective that we need in this discussion. We've heard the importance of bringing business uh, at the heart of the partnership. We have heard of the importance of anchoring the sustainable development goals in the national development strategies and the importance uh, of doing this uh, in the agricultural field, not just for agricultural or food safety and security, but also with a very big peace and reconciliation dimension. Uh, into that. I want to give the floor now to Kanayo Nguanze. He's the president of IFAT. Uh, I want to, uh, President, to ask you to bring a bit of uh, the perspective uh, from an international organization that is the leader.
help to share knowledge and best practices. We broke our relationships, as you can see from what has been said today, among governments and private sector, smallholders, to make one's, everyone's needs are met. Now, partnership is not exactly a new idea. That's why we need to breathe new life into the concept of, to achieve SDG 2. Although partnerships is not new, it depends on how you do it. So we can, make, we, can, we, can, we can create a platform for partnership that is totally new by seeing it from a, not, a new light. So it's not a negation of the old forms of partnership. It's basically doing partnerships from a new perspective. So innovation must apply both to what we do and how we do it. In Nepal, let me just give you one example. If I was working with the government and Intel cooperation, cooperation to improve crop yields of small farmers. Now what are they doing? They provide small farmers with access to laptops or mobile devices with specialized software. Now, and with this technology, farmers themselves can match soil chemistry with seeds, with fertilizer, pest control strategies. Farmers who never went to school. And as I always say, farmers are not stupid. They will grab opportunities when they know they can make money with it. Now, these types of innovative approaches demonstrate how technology can benefit smallholders and help them improve the running of their businesses. And all forms of agriculture, farming, whether it's small-scale fisheries, agriculture, crop husbandry, and the rest of them, is a business. Because basically, every farmer wants to make profit. It's a matter of scale. Let me not suggest that IFAD has all the answers. No. Far from it. This is precisely why we as an international community, multilateral agencies, private sector, national governments, and civil society need to work together. Our experiences have been generated not because we are IFAD, but because we are able to work in partnership with prime ministers as well with, as with rural communities in their villages. Now, during the course of this session, I hope that our speakers can lead us more deeply into how governments, businesses, and farmers can build more innovative partnerships, not just for the sake of achieving SDG 2, but also for enabling success in all other SDGs as well, but more importantly, importantly for the benefits of rural populations in the developing world. People, thank you. Excellent. So we have now uh, heard the third dimension uh, of this uh, uh, discussion today, which is innovative, innovative partnerships. And I stress the word innovative. Uh, we've, uh, we are little by little discovering this uh, innovative partnership that we are launching today called Blue Numbers, but uh, we are discovering this in the course of this conversation uh, more uh, to come. We are now uh, going to zoom in uh, one uh, particular commodity in which you have a lot of these components, partnerships, uh, uh, important uh, relevance of the commodity for uh, achieving the SDGs, and innovation. And we are going to do that uh, starting with uh, Juan Esteban Orduz. He's the CEO of the Colombian Coffee Federation uh, here in New York. Uh, Juan Esteban, tell us a little bit how you are uh, doing uh, this working in partnership uh, innovating in the sector of coffee. Okay, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Uh, my first question is, who do I tell when to change the slide? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, let me start by, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, saying that, that Colombia is very committed, as the minister said, Mr. Orozco said, Colombia is very committed to the, uh, to the SDGs and, uh, and we've been working on this Blue Number uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, inside the federation, the uh, the uh, can we move to the the next one? Okay, le let me give you no uh, number three. Yeah, let me give a little a little overview of uh, of um, Colombia's uh, coffee landscape. Uh, the first thing to say is, as Minister Roscoe mentioned, and I would repeat that, the, uh, the impact of coffee in the rural GDP of the country is huge, and uh, a country is the biggest employer in the countryside of Colombia, uh, coffee. 
The second thing is, uh, is uh, Colombia's coffee's presence is close to 54% of the municipalities of, of, of the country. If you look at the map of Colombia, you will see that, that you can kind of divide it into two parts. One is, is the, uh, the, the, from the Andes, the Andes entering Colombia, opening to, into three mountain chains. And then you have the east, southern east, southeastern part where most of the conflict has taken place, or a big part of the conflict, is not very developed. There's not much coffee there. And that is to underscore that coffee is not only in 54% of the municipalities of the country, it's also present in the municipalities in the part of the country where 95% of the population live. So that makes it, makes it very, very, uh, very important in terms of, our, of, uh, of uh, the social fabric and social impact. Next, please. I just want to underscore something uh, quick, which is most of the coffee growers in Colombia are very small, between zero and five hectares. And that's, that again tells you, uh, gives you an, an idea of the impact of, uh, of coffee in the countryside of Colombia. There are some studies that show that in areas where, where coffee was not present, was present uh, in coffee growing areas, the, uh, the uh, depth of the conflict was lower than, uh, than it was in other parts of the country. Next, please. So what is the federation? Uh, and uh, the, the Co Coffee Growers Federation. The Coffee Growers Federation is, is, uh, is uh, a private, non-profit uh, organization. We work very closely with the government, uh, in fact, and we, we, uh, we uh, do lots of social investment and we invest public funds uh, continuously and significantly with the government, so we work very closely with them all the time. Um, for the government, of course, it's also very important giving the the size of the coffee growing communities, as the, as the minister mentioned, we have about 560,000 families growing coffee in Colombia, which is about two and a half million people, more or less. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a significant, that's a huge, uh, huge uh, part of the rural population in, in Colombia. How does the federation work? And this is to, to put a context on how are we approaching the Blue Numbers Initiative. The federation is a, is a, a uh, a real federation. Um, it has, we have in each coffee growing municipality, we have a coffee growers committee, municipal coffee growers committee. We have about 360 of them, of those. Uh, the reason why there are less committees than the municipalities is in some cases they are so small that one committee serves more than one municipality. But the interesting thing here is that every, all the delegates for the 360 committees at the municipal level and the 15 state level committees are elected by the coffee growers by direct vote. That means every four years we elect, we elect 4,620 people to be members of the committees, to be the heads of the committees. Each committee has six principals and six deputies, uh, plus all the staff in the committee. So that's, that's a significant. Our own uh, internal election is bigger than, than uh, public elections in many countries. So, and it's true. Uh, last year we had an election and, uh, and the turnout was 67%. Uh, which, keeping in mind that a lot of many of, the, of those farmers are in remote municipalities, uh, is a huge turnout and, and certainly higher than, than the turnout in, in many countries. Uh, next, please. Next. Yeah. Okay. How are we addressing this, and uh, and uh, why have we have we advanced? We have. Uh, one, one interesting thing with the blue numbers is that lots of what the blue numbers uh, uh, you know, represent or what they achieve, a big part of it is already in place in Colombia. And that's a very interesting thing to, to note. I start with the with left column. I won't, I won't repeat everything that's there, but what I want to, to, uh, to underscore here is that we have our, our coffee formation system called SICA. It's for Sistema Información Cafetera in Colombia. Uh, we have every single farmer of the country georeferenced. We have, we can tell you, we know uh, how much, how much, uh, how many trees they have, which varietals, how many people live there, the level of education, uh, the services they have, do they have aqueducts, do they, don't they have electricity, don't they have education, all those things, we can, we can tell. And if we use them to help, uh, you know, work together with the government in, in all the social investment projects, but at the same time to help the coffee growers improve the quality, improve, uh, improve the sustainability uh, practices, and, and all, the, all the 
things that may be, may be uh, useful to them. Some tools that we have for that, I jump to the right uh, column, is first we have the extension service. We have uh, 1,200 agronomists that, that uh, uh, go all over the country. They are, each one of them has a car, their motorcycle, computers, and they go all over the country. They visit the farms and they, and they work with the, with the farmers in helping them best practices, uh, management, um, fighting against diseases that the, the coffee may have and so on. Uh, this is this is very important because that has allowed us to to keep a very healthy very healthy coffee sector, uh, but also requires a, a big big effort in, in terms of having all this infrastructure infrastructure in place. The other the other um, uh, one other uh, organ, institu institution I want to mention part of the federation is Ceni Cafe, which is not mentioned there. We have we also have the uh, the. Uh, um, one of the, of the best uh, research centers in the world in terms of, of coffee. We have more than 80 researchers, about uh, 20 plus are PhDs, working just on coffee, with different as aspects of coffee, from productivity to the scientific part to all those things. So, uh, next please. Okay. So this is, this is, uh, this is uh, in a nutshell, a little bit, Trying to start to, starting to connect what we do with the blue numbers. Uh, one of the of the key things that that we uh, that also help um, the, the, one of the of the key uh, uh, goals that we achieve with all this information in, in, uh, in, uh, in policies is that consumers are every day more sophisticated and they're looking for traceability. And this is to say that that the blue numbers and this is a, a point I want to illustrate here is blue numbers are not just, not just good for communities, society, and the environment, they are good for business. And we have this, the SICA, which is not that far away from, uh, from the blue numbers, uh, and it really works very well for business. And I have, for instance, Keurig here sitting with us. We do lots of work with them, uh, with, with many, many uh, coffee companies all over the world. And the, as consumers are looking for more traceability of to understand where the products come from, what they are drinking, what they are eating. It's very important to have all these uh, all these uh, things in place. So what do we do? Uh, next, please. On one hand, we have what the minister mentioned uh, uh, in advance. And I'm not going to stop uh, much here. Since the conflict in Colombia has has affected uh, mostly the countryside. Uh, the coffee sector is playing a key role. Is playing a key role in terms of uh, in terms of of uh, helping bring peace back to Colombia, or helping the government implement all the policies to to make a sustainable peace, go to sustainable peace in Colombia. But it's also a very good commercial strategy. Where I was mentioning before, uh, in a, it, to put somehow not repeat what is there. Uh, when you work, for instance, with a connection to clients and consumers, what does that mean? That sounds very, uh, you know, like out there, uh, ethereal. It really means that, for instance, small communities, co consumers want to buy coffee from small communities, and they want to have the information. Or in many cases, so we can track the information to what they're doing, track the values behind the coffee, track what is behind the cup of coffee that they're drinking. And again, as I said before, this is good for all purposes, but also good for business. Uh, in many cases, those communities produce very small quantities, so we, that has developed us those, this uh, strategy to, uh, to uh, reach out to small, to, to small market niches that are looking for certain, certain uh, for, with co for coffees with certain values behind them, and those those things uh, are very useful. And consumers consumers like like to pay for that. Next, please. With all this in place, and, and uh, I apologize for taking so much time, but, but with all this in place, uh, we are like a natural partner for the blue numbers, or for, or for, for, uh, for uh, all this, this whole policy, and, and, to, and to help the, the, uh, the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, we have already a pilot program in place. We have 60,000 farmers uh, from all over the country uh, working on uh, on this initiative on uh, and and uh, and 
being part of, of the blue numbers, it, that, what that takes is for us to some extent, and I, must, I, must, I want to be fair to everybody else, this is what we said, that we are much more advanced. Lots of what is being done was already in place in Colombia. So, uh, so uh, what we have done is try to adapt some of the, of, the, of the information we have there and transfer it to the blue numbers and, and try to make it match the best, way, the best way we can so we serve a higher purpose beyond just the, the, uh, the coffee sector, sector in Colombia. Those, uh, those coffee growers, and uh, next please. So it's uh, previous one. Thank you. No? That's another one in between. Okay, I have the other one. You don't have it. This one. <laughs> no, th those, those, uh, those uh, coffee growers, one thing, the thing we made, we made uh, a point to is make sure that they were all over the country. We, don't we didn't want to concentrate the whole thing in one region. We have, them, we have the, the coffee growers with, uh, with the blue numbers uh, all over the country. So we can, we can also at the same time you know, test how in practical terms and uh, being very blunt in business terms, how useful this is. Uh, as I was saying before, and just to wrap up, the, 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 remember the Federation is a nonprofit, but we are at the same time the biggest exporter in the country. So, uh, so we need to take care of business. At the same time, we, need, we take care of everything else. And, uh, and if one is to draw one conclusion here, is, uh, is, uh, I think that the, the Blue Numbers initi Initiative, as I said before, is very good for, for all the, the sustainable purposes and food security and, and, uh, and all those uh, much more altruistic purposes. But also, it's good for business, and the private sector should be very much involved with this. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Esteban, and thank you also for, uh, to the uh, Federation for being uh, a bit uh, the first guinea pig in testing that this blue numbers work. And what we hear from you, and it is very comforting, is that it works. And it works uh, not just, it works for the farmer, but it's very important that it works for the farmer because it's the main stakeholder. If the main stakeholder is not on board, it's no use. It works for the buyer who wants to purchase maybe from this farmer, but it also works to build trust with the consumer, a very important dimension. I want to thank Ana Paula Tavares, who is the uh, uh, interim president of the Rainforest Alliance. And uh, in order to give you uh, two seconds to uh, see what is uh, going on at the moment, I'm going to jump you and go uh, directly to Alfredo Gonzalez, if, uh, if you allow me. And like this, you. <laughs> it's another one that was blocked by uh, President Obama on his way out, presumably. Uh, so, uh, Alfredo is the Vice President of uh, Business Development for Control Union in the U.S. Control Union, for those of you who don't know it, is, an, uh, is a third-party auditor uh, for uh, standards. And what we want to hear from you, Alfredo, is how, uh, from the Control Union's perspective, uh, we can include uh, farmers and small and medium enterprises into this uh, sustainability path. Alfredo. Uh, just let me give a little bit of intro of, about Control Union. We were founded in the 1920s. Uh, we specialized in the fields of inspection, verification, certification, control, and analysis of agricultural and processed agricultural products. Uh, we are present in more than 70 countries and have uh, more than 100 offices worldwide. Um, next, please. Why are we here? Uh, Fifteen years ago, we started with uh, our certification services. We grew from just being an organic certifier to having today more than 200 different products of certification programs. We cover almost all of the crops, livestock, forestry. Uh, we are we certify in five continent in the five continents. Uh, we are directly engaged with uh, 7,000 farmers worldwide where we hold the contract. And indirectly, but with a very close reach, farmer associations, maybe the farmer association is our client, and the members of the associations are not considered our direct clients. But if we add all of these farmer groups that we work with together, we reach over a million farmers and uh, these farmers would be rather easy to include on, on the blue numbers for us. We also work with uh, food companies, with uh, very large companies that have large agricultural supply chains 
um, and we're currently helping them. So if these companies would like to jump into the blue numbers, it would be also kind of uh, easy for us to, to help them. How do we do this? We have uh, more than a thousand people going to the meeting farmers and processors on a daily basis. So we say we have the boots in the ground. So we are every day on the farms, talking to farmers. So we have knowledge on what are the farmer problems, what are the, the problems of the region, uh, what, what improvements need to be done. Then why is it important for a, for a farmer to have better practices, to improve their practices? Why should a farmer be certified in a, in a, in a good, agricultural uh, good agricultural practices program? Why? Because the farmer, it increases the productivity and it reduces the production costs. Uh, I always remember when we started in 2002 with Christian, with Global Gap, and we had the, the, the first trainings for the farmers and they say, why are you requiring all of these? Why are Europeans, why are the supermarkets requiring all of this information? And uh, they, were, they were a bit reluctant to, to, to adopt the, the good agricultural practices. But after one year, I mean, I was just receiving a lot of calls from my office. Said, Thank you very much, Alfredo. I mean, it was a very good decision for, for us. Uh, we have improved our, uh, our productivity. Now we take, we take uh, decisions with information. And what happens with farmers is that usually they take decisions without having the information and when, without analyzing what's happening into the fields. Uh, good agricultural practices also help the farmers to gain market access and to gain the loyalty of the final buyer. And uh, that's, it. that's very clear and very important because nowadays you have the uh, final buyers, the agribusinesses, the retailers helping and financing the farmers to get certified or to get verified. So that's really important. What it also does, and maybe that's one of the most important reasons on why a small farmer should get certified or verified, is that it benchmarks the practices of the small farmer with a bigger farm. So that uh, gives the same level of competition. It really makes them more competitive. And what it also does, it makes the regional community is stronger because the small farmers, they all hold the same problems. They, 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 all of the, most all of the solutions are applied to the same farmers. So it, it, that's also really important. Next, please. Uh, Why it's important to, to engage with government? Uh, you have it? Oh, you don't have it here. Okay. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Thank you. Government engagement. Currently, we are working with many governments. Uh, many governments have their own rules for importing food or or paying subsidies for agricultural products. For example, we work with the EPA on the on biofuel pro programs or with the FDA with organic agriculture or with the new FISMA law that's gonna, that's gonna uh, be approved in the US in the, in the next few months. So we already have engaged with, with governments, but we, we work with, with governments using their own programs. For the future and the blue numbers, I think that certification and verification brings a lot of data and data that the government doesn't know, that is not in the reach of the government. So if we can work together with governments, I think we can, we can have a lot of, of, of information that is in the interest of, of the government. Uh, we can identify different problems in different regions if we work together when we conduct our assessments, uh, we can find, for example, that the, the last one I can think of 
is there was a coffee disease, a, a, a very bad coffee disease uh, called uh, Roya. Uh, rust. Rust, uh, uh, yellow rust. And uh, Colombia was not affected, but uh, we saw, because we do a lot of audits in coffee in many different regions, we saw that the Re Dominican Republic started to get hit, Peru started to get hit, that Bolivia started to get hit, but we didn't communicate this to governments or, or because we didn't have the platforms. But if we have the blue numbers, I mean, it's, it's, it, that could have made a difference. Blue numbers impact. Uh, okay. The current situation for the small farmer is that they don't have any access to the final buyer. I mean, if I use an example here, I'll say I'm Peruvian, I'll say quinoa. Quinoa is a, uh, most maybe tr the most trendy crop right now. It's fancy, uh, it's fashion, uh, but it also has a supply chain. Maybe it's a supply chain of 50,000 farmers in Peru. It's grown in different regions. Uh, but if you see the supply chain, you have one exporter and you have 50,000 small farmers that are not linked to this direct exporter. You have one middleman, two middlemen, three middlemen sitting on the crop. So the farmer is really invisible. You don't see the market. The, the exporter doesn't see the farmer. The exporter that sits 500 kilometers worth of production is done, doesn't know the farmer, doesn't know where the farmer is. So it's very important that uh, the blue numbers make this farmer visible, visible for the, fi for the final buyer. Uh, we need to create a tool whether the, f the, the final user can search for, for, for the small farmer. What the blue numbers can also do is facilitate the governmental extension services. Uh, <coughs> problems will be clearer to be solved if the government has the information, and blue numbers could allow this. And also, uh, that's very important, certification and verification is done yearly or in a cycle. So we could update the information of a farmer yearly or uh, within the upload cycle of the audit. So that's not uh, just being updating the information or uploading the information once, but really updating it in a, in a cycle or in a year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfredo. Let me now uh, quickly move on to Ana Paula Tavares, uh, Rainforest Alliance. Uh, Rainforest has shown that there is no incompatibility between uh, growth uh, and good practices, respect for standards, in particular sustainability standards. Uh, Ana Paula. Thank you, and, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we get the microphone for the speaker, please. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> we at uh, Rainforest Alliance have been around for uh, close to 29 years, and we're all working to uh, conserve biodiversity and ensure sustainable livelihoods by transforming land use practices business practices and consumer behavior. There are about 350 uh, members of our staff spread globally, working with hundreds of uh, local partners in achieving this mission. Next. Um, this, is, this is our, our motto, our market-based motto. Um, of market catalyzed conservation utilizing standards, certification, uh, market linkages and smallholder focused technical assistance. Uh, we have been able to transform the norms and practices of key global commodity value chains including those of coffee, banana, teas, uh, other fruits. There are about 50 uh, there are really a hundred crops. The Sustainable Agriculture Network is working with, with 50 um, being more active than, than not. And today, almost 60%, 6 percent of the world's coffee, 5.5% uh, of bananas, 15% of the tea, 14% uh, of the cocoa are coming from this 
uh, Rainforest Alliance supported sustainable production covering 3 million hectares of uh, land and impacting, we're working with over a million farmers in, uh, like in agriculture, about 50 to 60 countries. And uh, much of this growth, growth has taken place uh, over the last five years. Next. So really the aim here is to support and improve practices on the ground, aiming at healthier farmers and healthier landscapes. There are about roughly 10 principles and they range from environmental to social issues, economic issues, uh, local law compliance, etc. cetera, that uh, then there are about 100 criteria and hundreds of indicators that auditors check when visiting a farm. But you can see here some of these, um, uh, the, the focused issues on water systems, forests, uh, uh, waste management, uh, housing for workers, protection of biodiversity, health, the school, um, and a, a number of issues that we are um, hoping to improve through our work. And uh, now with the New York Declaration of uh, Forests, we are looking to help companies, governments meet their commitments. Next. This is a, um, a study done by COSA, that, an independent study from 2011, where we looked at about uh, 117 Rainforest Alliance certified farms versus 135 or so uh, control farms. And the, the outcome was um, exciting to see that on average yields on certified farms were 70% higher than those of non-certified farms. And uh, through that, the average revenue earned by certified farmers was about 72% higher than that of non-certified farmers. So this is, this is one example of what we want to achieve in as many places as possible. And you, we, we see working globally that you can find some exciting um, uh, results or, or outcome of the work in places like, like this on this specific issue and some other very exciting biodiversity impact in some other areas and uh, other impact about water that is really exciting. What we need to do is how do we take this example here. This does not mean that in every Rainforest Alliance certified farm productivity is increasing at 70 percent. So how do we how do we exchange um, uh, knowledge, lessons learned, and information? And we feel like the blue number is uh, a, a really exciting step forward toward A, putting all farmers, especially smallholders, on the map so that exchange of information from them to them becomes easier and uh, extension services and, and other um, other efforts that can, that can help them achieve the increased productivity and, and these various goals um, can be achieved uh, easier. Next, please. Um, so, we also, um, in terms of, of looking a little bit uh, deeper into the, actually you can, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Rainforest Alliance is, we're working in 89 countries, so that's our forestry, tourism, and agriculture work, and uh, have 126 million acres of land that are under sustainable management. So now looking a little bit more into some of the, the, some of the examples, uh, 
some of what we are learning from farmers, and we hope very much that the blue number will help us uh, with our, uh, so some of what we are hearing from farmers, aging plants or, or seeing on the ground, aging plants and insufficient basic agronomic practices, unfamiliarity of practices to reduce vulnerability to climate change, difficulty in assessing uh, financial services, lack of strong governance, cooperative structures, business capacity, capital and knowledge of the market, and uh, inability to compete with local traders for buying crops from their members. And of course, rampant spread of, of crop diseases as, as, you, uh, as you mentioned. So um, we hope that the blue number will help by increasing farmers' access to training materials, technical assistance, other opportunities on uh, these this issues by increasing their awareness of extension agency offerings. Uh, for, for example, if there is an educational event nearby and, and uh, a farmer can get, um, can get something through their phone, acknowledging them that there is an opportunity for them to learn that they may find uh, valuable that uh, that's how we are seeing. So the, the Rainforest Alliance, now we're looking at, um, at working in places like with, with uh, FNC in, in Colombia, finding how we can, we're already working together, so how this will increase our, our tools in our toolkit to help farmers and, and in, in various places in the world. So n right now we're looking where we are going to pilot. We're probably not going to start as bold as FNC with 60,000, but probably with a, a smaller number, maybe 50 to 100 farmers, <coughs> just to test and pilot and see how this might work. And uh, we're not sure yet if this is going to be with uh, uh, tea farmers in, in um, East Africa, India, China, Argentina, or with uh, coffee farmers in Asia, East Africa, or Latin America, or so we're we're, we're taking a look at uh, at that and look forward to working with uh, the UN uh, Global Compa uh, Com Compact with ITC and with all of you on moving this forward and and uh, ultimately uh, providing. Uh, more opportunities for farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Paula. We are running a little bit uh, short of time, so uh, don't uh, get stressed if I uh, move my hands. But it, it means that uh, <laughs> it means that we have to uh, we have to advance. Uh, before we go to uh, Monique Oxander, who is uh, Chief Sustainability Officer at Coring uh, Green Mountain, I want to. Uh, Pass the floor onto Janet Wouters Nestle, who was waving. Thank Janet. you, Arancha. Um, I wanted to share very briefly something I heard at a meeting, a side meeting on Friday last. I won't identify the meeting, but Jeffrey Sachs said, we do not know how to achieve SDG 2. Jeffrey Sachs said, we do not know how to achieve SDG 2. And I'd like to, in this meeting, disagree, particularly around sustainable agriculture. You can hear from the conversation that we do know a lot. We've worked a lot. Nestle had the privilege of working with the UN Global Compact on the FAB principles. And I think through that process, we know that many of the players around this table do know how to work with smallholder farmers. And our interests are dramatically aligned to, with the, in, the government of Colombia, with the FNC, with the Rainforest Alliance. The critical concern about Colombian coffee farmers is as important to Nestle as it is to the government of Colombia and the others around the table. We are worried that the average age of the Colombian coffee farmer is 57. It's not good for Nespresso, it's not good for Nescafe, it's not good for the smallholder farmer. So I do think we have a real opportunity in SDG2 building on the FAB principles, working in new ways around this table. And so I would go back to what the gentleman from EFAD said, please, let's find ways. Sometimes these problems can be solved in one by one-on-one -on -one partnerships. Sometimes they have to be solved with just unique ways to work collectively and share 
best practices because there's so much expertise around the table and we stand ready to share what we have learned by working with coffee farmers, cocoa farmers, dairy farmers, and our direct contact with 700,000 farmers around the world. But I think we do know, and we, I thank you for this meeting. Thank you, Janet, and it, uh, uh, it is very clear that we should talk to Jeffrey Sachs uh, to make sure that at least he knows that we know. So uh, let's uh, hear from Monique Oxender. Monique, uh, Coring is a brand uh, you've been uh, sourcing a lot uh, uh, from uh, farmers and you've embarked them on a path of sustainability. Uh, let's hear from you. Great, thank you. And thanks for having me today. You know, I also I, I want to commend the community for adopting the SDGs, but also, and maybe importantly, so in, uh, commending those who drafted the SDGs. I know it's part of the, the vision for the future to have those SDGs tied closely to core business strategies. And I think that they're well phrased, and I look forward to implementation. So Keurig Green Mountain, formerly known as Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, is um, on one hand an innovative technology company. We design and manufacture single-serve brewers, so hot beverages including primarily coffee. And on the other hand, we're a beverage company and we own over 30 brands including Green Mountain Coffee, Tully's, Diedrich, Timothy's, Van Hoot, and on and on. Those of you who are coffee lovers, which I assume there's probably quite a few in the room, know that coffee is a very personal experience and you want your coffee. So just as important as our own innovation and our own products is actually the products from what would otherwise be our competitors and are in many cases. So we partner very deeply with companies like Dunkin' Donuts, like Starbucks, Caribou, Folgers, a long list so that coffee in someone's home can be the personal experience that it should be each morning, each day. That partnership that obviously needs to play out in the marketplace for us extends to our supply chain very, um, as well. Columbia is one of our largest and most critical sourcing regions. And as such, it is essential for the security of our coffee supply for us to understand the environmental, the economic, the social, the geopolitical issues that impact our business. For us, that extends to the livelihood of the farmers that are supplying the coffee. Like many other coffee communities in Central and South America, about 40% of families in Colombia suffer from food insecurity on an annual basis. So Keurig commissioned a study in 2010 to understand the issue of food insecurity within our sourcing regions. That study surfaced very complex and intertwined issues including climate change, price volatility, poor access to water, historical conflicts in the region, and pests and plagues, as has been mentioned. As a beverage system company that was reliant on good quality, consistent supply of coffee, we knew that we had to address food security across our base and specifically around our Colombian suppliers in order to build a more resilient supply chain and ensure the continuity of the products, such as this one, our Colombia uh, Fair Trade Select. We also knew that we couldn't do it alone, has been mentioned many times. This is a, a collective endeavor. And to drive significant change on this issue, we needed to engage stakeholders or partners all across our value chain. We have a long history of impact investment and I stress the word investment because it truly is an investment in our supply chain in our communities more so than it is charity. Certifications and trans traceability is required and it's a starting point, but it's not enough. So I wanted to give you an example of what that kind of traceability and transparency can lead to and the power that can be unleashed with good data and good information about your suppliers. We entered into a partnership with Mercy Corps and Cafe Sur. Cafe Sur is a coffee cooperative, one of our long-term suppliers in southern Tolima, Colombia, where over half of the population lives in poverty and food insecurity. And, around, uh, and food insecurity specifically affects around 70% of the rural population in Tolima. So through this triangulated partnership, we aim to reduce the food insecurity of 1,300 families. So just a starting point, but that's in year one in six growing municipalities uh, by formalizing land tenure, increasing home gardens, crop diversity, and building cooperative capacity. So the programs achieved um, some primary results. So all 1,300 families 
1,300 families have established home gardens to grow fresh food, and 100% of the beneficiary families increase the daily, uh, the diversity of their daily nutritional intake. Obviously, this ties directly to SDG2. Many of those families are now also able to sell the surplus produce, contributing uh, almost a 40% increase in their monthly income. Additionally, the project garnered 128 legal certifications of property rights. Next slide, with an emphasis on improving access to land for women and youth. And this allows them to access credit and additional services to bolster their productivity. Next. It additionally built the capacity of Cafe Sur and municipal authorities so that they could manage water and land resources and provide enhanced services to their members and constituents, like land formalization and agricultural extension. So we're very proud of this project, but there's still so much left to do. Last year, we approached one of our partners, Starbucks, who we collaborate for um, improved livelihoods on the ground. And through additional funding from Starbucks, the program be able to expand the number of participants and ensure that the program evolves year over year. We hope to continue and are actively pursuing deeper partnerships in Colombia and beyond to achieve similar and deeper impacts. Thank you so much, Monique. That was, uh, that was very... Uh very inspiring seeing it from uh, the perspective of the buyer. Uh, Chris Jonik, CEO and President of Landesa. Uh, Landesa is about uh, supporting land rights, social rights, a very important component uh, for making this type of system work since this is based on geolocalization. Uh, Chris, what uh, is your perspective on uh, this initiative? Thanks, Arantxa. I am so new to Landessa that actually when I got this invite, I was still with Oxfam. So I'm, I'm talking with two hats today. Um, but thanks for inviting me, and I'll try to be quick. I can't cut anything, so I'm just going to talk more quickly with apologies to the translators. I could cut a little, but... Um, the first comment I want to make is that, and I think this was underscored by the gentleman from IFAD, is that when we're talking about hunger uh, for the SDGs number two, uh, it's in part about more food and less waste for sure, but it, what it's really about is access. And access is all about who has the power to get food. Uh, and so this, I hope we frame discussions like this really about empowering those that uh, are marginalized and don't have access to somehow get access. And when we're thinking about those that are most marginalized, we have to turn to the rural poor and people that depend on land uh, and, and smallholder farmers. So I think uh, under the SDGs number two, maybe the third target is the most important, and I'm just going to paraphrase a little piece of that. The third target it says that uh, we need to double productivity and incomes of small-scale food producers through secure and equal access to land, especially for women, indigenous peoples, and others. This is really critical, and this is... Uh, I will say um, my first real comment here has, goes to land rights because that's what land S is all about. But land getting into the SDGs, uh, I think, is one of the most important achievements of the SDGs. Uh, traditionally, land rights have gone uh, almost implicit or unmentioned. Uh, they haven't really come up in this conversation, even though I know that um, in Colombia, land is one of the critical components of the conflict there for years. Um, many of the certification schemes just assume that the farmers have secure tenure. Uh, but we know all throughout Africa for existence, uh, something like 90% of the land is unregistered and many farmers simply don't have secure rights. And if you don't have secure rights, then you don't invest in it and you don't conserve it and you don't get the benefits of, uh, of government services. And so the first most critical issue I think underscoring SDGs 2, or at least one of them, has to be ensuring that the farmers have some kind of security to their, to their land. Uh, and that will, um, we call that a gateway right. It brings all kinds of other benefits. Certainly it will improve productivity and incomes, uh, but it also, if it's um, security for, for, for women in particular, we know that it improves things like health, education, nutrition, and voice, which is really critical. If you don't have rights to your land, you're often voiceless in your community. And so uh, land rights is, uh, serves all of those functions. My second point goes to opaqueness, or uh, really what, what I think Blue Numbers is all about, bringing more transparency to the supply chains. 
Uh, when I was at Oxfam, one of our big campaigns was behind the brands. We were all about trying to br shed light on what's going on in these, these sort of opaque food chains because it's so hard to even understand the first tier, let alone trace all the way from the final brand down to the farmer. And without that, that means that consumers, shareholders, and others really can't hold companies accountable for their commitments. They can't engage effectively around these issues. Uh, but for the companies also, it's a problem. And at Oxfam, working with the UN Global Compact, we've just launched this uh, new tool called the Poverty Footprint uh, Tool, and it's all about collaborations between NGOs and companies to really understand their supply chains and their impacts on poverty. And what we have found working with companies like Unilever, Coke, SAB Miller, is that companies themselves don't appreciate the impact that they can potentially have on the lives of tens of thousands of farmers. Small little business decisions can have enormous impacts. And so for companies, there's real opportunities that are being missed because they don't have that vision into their supply chain. But there's also real risks for them. So when we went talking to companies uh, about land grabs and land conflicts. Many of them said they didn't have any policies on it. They said it's not an issue for them. And we showed them that, th that it was. And we started exposing and even scandalizing these companies. And increasingly, companies will be scandalized because of land conflicts and land grabbing. And if they don't know who their farmers are and they don't know what that land tenure looks like, it's a real risk for them. And finally, as, as one of the earlier speakers uh, mentioned, that information that comes from greater transparency is critical for the farmers themselves. They need that to be engaged and empowered. So the, my second big point is, is, is getting some traction on this question of opaqueness, and I really have to commend uh, Blue Numbers for, for the effort that it's making in that direction. Finally, a really quick point. Companies have enormous influence, and they've got to start exercising it. It's great to see companies at places like this. Nestle is always a champion, which I really give them credit for. Unilever, Corey Green Mountain for sure. Public champions, but there's all, all kinds of other companies that could be pushed to do more in terms of what we call, and this was another UN Global Compact report with Oxfam, talking the walk. That means it's not enough to do good work inside your company. You also have to look outwards and be a public proponent for these kinds of important sustainability issues and for the issues underlying hunger. We pushed uh, companies like PepsiCo, Coke, and others to take a public position on land rights, and they did. They stepped up and they did it, and it, it's made a huge impact. It makes an impact with their business partners, their supply chain partners, but also governments. We need companies to work with governments and also to exercise their influence on governments around these issues, and, and we know that they can with a little bit of um, incentivizing or a little bit of pushing. So that's my final point, and thanks again for inviting me. Thank you so much, Chris. The good thing about uh, moving from Oxfam to Landesa is that uh, the energy and the enthusiasm uh, and the activism is uh, still there. Now, uh, here comes the technology bit, because for all of this to work, it can only work if technology is supporting uh, the functioning of the system. And for that, uh, we have to thank Miguel Lopera, President and CEO of uh, GS1 Global, who at the end of the day is the guy that is going to make this work. Miguel. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to, to everybody. Uh, unfortunately, I, I worked in technology many years ago and now my, my knowledge on technology is limited. I'll try to make the, my exposition very high level so everybody can understand. So before we talk about blue numbers, just have some words on, on GS1 because many of you probably you are not aware of what, uh, what we do. So GS1 is a global standards and services organization that everybody knows us because uh, our most famous product is the barcode that you find all across the world. So this is GS1. And, uh, but now this was uh, created 40 years ago and now we operate with uh, 24 sectors and uh, our core competencies, identification, registration, and then the service that we provide, one of the strongest services is about traceability of food and products, which is very, very connected to what we, we are discussing here. We have over 1.5 million uh, users of the GS1 system, and uh, practically 99.99% are small and medium enterprises. So GS1 is a, is a global federation. We have uh, local offices, local GS1 offices in 112 countries, which is fundamental because when you develop a, 
a, a global standard or a global service, the technical part is the easy part. The difficult part is to train these 1.5 million people in all those countries. This is why, why our local organizations are very well trained and prepared to provide education and training, which is probably the biggest challenge that we have in this project. So we are neutral, we are not for profit, and uh, our governance is a general assembly in which we have one representative from every country. So we are not influenced, I mean, we are influenced by companies and sectors, but at the end is the voice of these uh, 112 countries, what is important. So next is uh, created 40 years ago, but let's go to the initiative. What is the, this, uh, this initiative? We, we have joined UNGC and ITC in this initiative to provide what we know, which is a global registry for sustainable farmers with two main objectives. One is to make global food and agricultural systems more sustainable and uh, enable farmers and agribusiness to think and operate in a sustainable way. And uh, at the end of the day, if we achieve that, we will achieve food security, security, which is our final objective. So next, please. So this was the what and now the how. What are we going to do? What we are building, what we have built, is a, is a registry. And uh, so every farmer in any place of the world, through a smartphone or through a laptop, will just enter into the website and enter very, very basic data. And they can enter very basic data and if they want, because it's optional, they can enter more information about the product that they crop and uh, they can decide, my target is to export to Germany. And the system will provide information about all the requirements if you want to export to, to Germany. I mean, what else, the global gap certification. So it's going to be an incredible help for all those little farmers to know how sustainable is the way as they are operating. And, uh, and the very, very important thing is because this is uh, something funded by the United Nations, is going to be for free. And I have to say, and I have to thank some of the countries participating in this uh, first pilot. They are already, they are already um, uh, providing uh, smartphones to the farmers so they can, they, can, they can accelerate that. So this is good not only for uh, for farmers, is good for multinational companies. Next, please. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, that all the multinational companies are extremely interested in sustainability, and they have said it uh, in many, many different places. Next, please. I want to insist a little bit here on policymakers, because thanks to all the information that this registry is going to have, uh, the governments will know much in depth what is the production, the areas, and they can take um, uh, policies just to, to favor those areas in which the production is, uh, is better served and the areas in which is more sustainable. And next, please. And the, the last uh, but not least is, uh, is about consumers, because at the end of the day, you know that this new consumer with their smartphone is much more demanding on information and uh, so they are going to be also benefit with this. Next, please. And uh, this is to conclude. I think that we are in, uh, under an incredible initiative that is helping everybody. And the plea and the ask to all of you is uh, please join those pilots that uh, we already have in places like Vietnam, Malaysia, Colombia, Turkey, uh, countries like uh, Netherlands and Denmark that are joining because if we want to make it a success, we need all of you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Puban uh, Selvananatha. He is the head of the ITC office in New York, previously with the UN Global Compact. Uh, he knows all about the Blue uh, Numbers Initiative together with uh, Joe Bosniak uh, to my left because they are a bit the, the brains that have uh, thought a little bit about this Puvan. Thank you, Ranja. Uh, thank you to so many in this room who've helped us to get to this point. 
Um, I think I'm going to, to just expound on what uh, Miguel has said. The Blue Number Initiative, of course, at its, very, at its very core is an identification system, but the way that we're looking at it here across the UN agencies is it's an infrastructure for food systems and for food security. If you want to pl fly millions of planes through the air, somebody's got to be controlling air traffic. If you want to put millions of cars and buses on the road, somebody's got to write the rules as to how people drive, how people um, behave with each other. You know, this idea of the Blue Number Initiative essentially sets uh, a condition of infrastructure, and that's how people should be looking at it. It's not a certification system. It's not a standard. It's infrastructure that allows for certification and standards to happen. Next, please. So um, our food systems today, I believe, are basically half a bridge. Uh, supply chains, they look at efficiencies, they look at standards, they look at consumer expectations, but it's usually engineered from the demand side. And when we start looking at this bridge, uh, all the costs accrue to either the consumer or the producer. And also, we don't really know where this bridge is going to land. If we ask today different certification bodies, we ask different standards, different countries, they all have a different place as to where this bridge should land. Next, please. So my daughter helped me prepare this slide. Um, <laughs> so what we see here is you know, the, the string line, the top line, the blue line here that actually gives us the direction of the bridge is what's been agreed here over the last couple of days. It's about government policy until 2030. It gives governments a direction. The SDGs allow governments to think in the framework of some bigger, bigger picture ideas. Um, the blue numbers is about farmers being able to build the bridge from the other side to meet where industry has been over the last 20 to 30 years. It allows for us to start looking bottom up. It allows for us looking horizontally, all these wonderful words that actually mean something now because we have the means to do it, because blue numbers allow people to take action by themselves to say, okay, I want to come and meet the certification bridge. I don't need to wait for somebody to fly out from Denmark or from Netherlands to come and see where I am. I'm going to put myself onto this map first. Now, the important thing about this bridge on the other side, which is by farmers sharing their own data, is that it is supported by every SDG indicator and metric that you will be able to read today, the 169 indicators, the 17 global goals as they're now called as of Friday as opposed to the SDGs. All of those aspects are built into what we would expect for the farmers to share and to express as their needs. They can say, I want this thing. I'm not having it in my area. How can I get it? They are basically volunteering themselves to become part of the global food system. And the pillar on the other side is that the neutral oversight by the UN system means that every agency in the UN system is there to help the farmer, is there to help the companies, is there to ensure that we can help by telling you this is what the governments may be moving towards. No government today, except for Colombia probably is you know, advanced in this, aspect, in this aspect, has actually been able to match the SDG indicator set to what a community requires. Over the next two to three years, this is what governments are going to be doing. Agricultural policy for the next two to three years is how do we make these indicators happen? We as the UN system will be able to help companies in that journey to make sure they're at the right tables, listen to how governments are making these policies happen. Next, please. This is just a, you know, a historical thing. There's a new and an old here. At the bottom, it used to be the agriculture led to industry. Industry led to services. This was the economic development of the planet, the world. This is how the World Bank thought about things in the 1980s. On one side, there was a solid bubble, which was business. Never should it ever meet government. It was on the other side of industrial regulation. Everybody was kind of not connected. This is the old way of doing things, because we didn't have ICT. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have social media. The new way of doing things is that that whole stuff, all of that is just in the middle somewhere, and it's all conflated. Customers and farmers and so forth, they don't care if you're a business, if you're a government, because that might be the only thing that they see. Certification might be equivalent to regulation. Who knows? All they're talking about is how do I get my product from here to there? Is it a government law? Is it a national requirement? Is it an international foreign state? I don't care. Tell me what I need to do. Tell me how I can access the skills, the capacity building, the extension services. How do I get from here to there? And this link between agriculture and consumer in the market is so much more direct today. And it goes through all of these things in the middle, and all of those things in the middle are transparent to each other. You can no longer hide behind, I'm a government, I'm a regulation. It doesn't work that way anymore. So this is the new pattern for development. 
Just to expound on this, and I'll close with this, I think for too long agriculture has essentially been defined by very extractive models. Extractive political institutions, extractive economic processes. But this is not evil. It's just the way that we've been able to do things up to now. There's no malicious intent. It was just the best way we could do things. But as I said before, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these services today reach hundreds of millions of people, and that number is just growing. Many of these hundreds of millions of people are actually farmers. If you go into many economies today, emerging economies, they use Facebook as a tool on how to share practices and how to do things. So farmers themselves use Facebook, but farmers are also consumers. If we look at the ASEAN region, which we'll be talking about shortly, you know, that bulk of people are the same people who are then going to go out and buy the shampoos, going to buy all the other things, going to drive the economy. Farmers have knowledge, and what they want is opportunities for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. And they want to share this knowledge, and Blue Numbers is actually aligned for this to happen. So they will, they will will and they will want to share their information because though that process, the blue numbers, opens the gates for them to participate. I hope that you know, this actually conveys the idea that is infrastructure. Gates, roads, think that. Thank you very much, Puban. Uh, thank you for... So what have we learned in this session? One, uh, that the blue numbers is a bit uh, the Facebook of the United Nations uh, for Sustainable Agriculture. We'll have to talk uh, not just to Jeff Sachs, but we'll also now have to talk to Mark Zuckerberg to make sure that he's, he's in line with that. This is going to help uh, one and foremost farmers. It's going to give them a voice. It's going to give them visibility. Um, it's going to help them uh, with connectivity. With joining value chains, it's going to help them with networking. Three, it's going to help them improve their sustainability their competitiveness. Four, it's going to uh, help them share best practices, exchange information, uh, a bit uh, the platform uh, to share training materials and so on that we heard about. Second, uh, it's going to be useful for buyers, for corporations. Why? Because it's good for their business. They find their suppliers. Uh, two, uh, they can have clearer, more transparent traceable value chains. And I start from the principle that in, in principle a good corporation wants its value chain to be traceable and transparent because that is what will give trust to the consumers. Uh, three, it's going to help these buyers, these corporations also embed its entire value chain into a sustainability path. Three, for consumers, this is about trust. It is about knowledge. It is about information. It is about knowing where the product uh, that I consume comes from. Finally, for government, and this is a dimension that is extremely important, this is big data. It's big data uh, to, uh, to have trends, it's big data to control diseases, it's big data to measure productivity, it is big data to uh, have levers uh, to work on for growth, uh, it is good for extension services, and so on and so forth. So for now, our tentative uh, answer at the end of this first session is that this UN Facebook uh, for Sustainable Agriculture can work to help us deliver on this SDG 2 uh, and all the connected uh, SDGs around it. Uh, we are going at this point to make a pause of two minutes to change the setting. We are now going to zoom in uh, an, a part of the world uh, where this uh, issue of sustainable agriculture and sustainable agricultural practices is extremely important, the ASEAN region. So don't go, just two minutes, uh, three minutes, uh, take a bit of a coffee, and then we come back. Thank you.